The Mariners are back home, but the schedule does not get any easier. After taking two or three from the defending World Series champs, they now face the team the Rangers beat in the fall classic, the Arizona Diamondbacks. Get you set for the weekend series coming up here on the Locked On Mariners podcast. Colby, hit it. You are Locked On Mariners, your daily Seattle Mariners podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ahoy, sailors. It is Friday, April 26, 2024. This is Titan Gonzalez and Colby Patnode for the Locked On Mariners podcast brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more, and right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, bucks, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on, that's L-O-C-K-D-O-N, to get yourself started. Thank you so much for making us your first listen. Subscribe, like, and turn on alerts if you're watching on YouTube. Or subscribe and leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform if you like what you hear. And if you're part of the crew and rock with us every single day, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. And if you want to hear from us even more, please consider signing up for our Patreon. You can now get a free seven-day trial to check out the show. The link, as well as our social accounts, is in the description of this episode. Mariners kick off a three-game set with the Diamondbacks tonight at T-Mobile Park. You can catch all the action on the Mariners' hometown broadcast on Sirius XM with the SXM app. All you have to do is search Mariners. Quite a few familiar faces on this Diamondbacks roster, of course. We'll see if Paul Sewald is one of them. He's been rehabbing from a strained oblique, but it seems like he's pretty close to making his return as of a couple days ago. Uh, but there's still Cattell Marte, a Eugenio Suarez, of course, and the local kid, Corbin Carroll. Diamondbacks, though, off to kind of a slow start. They're 12-14 and 14 on the year. Now, their offense has been very good. They put up double-digit games multiple times already, but their pitching has been kind of middle of the pack. Now, pitching isn't an issue for them tonight on paper, however. Zach Gallen, one of the best righties in the game, is going for them in game one. We'll get to him and the rest of the pitching matchups a little bit later on. But Colby, what do you make of the Diamondbacks and what are your general thoughts heading into the series? Yeah, it should be a pretty fun series. Uh, These are certainly two teams that have playoff aspirations this year. Uh, And, you know, like the upcoming series against Atlanta, this series also represents kind of a strength on strength matchup where, you know, the Diamondbacks lead the majors and runs scored. And now they've done that on the back of like, three games where they've scored about 40 runs. So like, you know, that can sway the sample size pretty significantly, but they're also pretty consistently putting up runs uh, early on in the season. It's a very good lineup. It's deep. You've already mentioned Marte and Carroll, and then there's Suarez and Jock Peterson and, and Gurriel. I mean, it, it, it's a pretty good lineup, uh, you know, filled, filled with guys who can beat you in a lot of different ways. They have speed, they have power, they play defense. Like it is a, it is a good roster. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how Seattle's starting pitching kind of lines up, uh, with the next two teams, but obviously Arizona is first. So, um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see how they handle the speed, uh, that Arizona could bring to the table. This is a team in the Mariners that has struggled at times to really control a running game. Uh, and we know that guys like Corbin Carroll are capable of stealing 70 bags, 50, 50 to 70 bags in a year. And, and like, we know that they have speed up and down this lineup. They have it on the bench as well. So, uh, you know, how they control the run game, not giving up extra bases when the Mariners have really struggled uh, to prevent runs is when the opposing team can kind of create uh, runs with their legs, uh, put a lot of pressure on this defense, which, you know, unfortunately now without JP Crawford has a really shallow, like mediocre at best defensive middle infield. Uh, so, you know, when you look at what, Cleveland was able to do when you look at what Boston was able to do early in the year those are two teams that could really make a lot of contact and they can really run the bases and and they were able to put a lot of pressure uh, on the Mariners defense to be perfect and and so you know and that's obviously less likely to be the case when your backup shortstop is out there so yeah it's it's an interesting matchup it's a bit of a difficult one uh, but it is strength on strength it's your starting pitching versus their offense uh, and then I have a hunch this might come down to a battle of the bullpens. And right now, both teams' bullpens are a little bit banged up. You know, they're missing some really big pieces. We'll see if Arizona gets Seawald back. I'm sure Paul really wants to play in this series, but you can't rush an oblique. Like, it, it's just yeah. unfortunate timing, but that's the reality. He got into one rehab game. Do they think that's good enough? Maybe. 
Mm. Uh, but we'll, we'll probably know what they do here in the next couple hours on him. So yeah, we'll see if Paul pitches. Uh, but yeah, I think this is going to come down to the bullpens a little bit here. I, I think, you know, Seattle, you can't get into a slug slug fest with this lineup. You're, you're outgunned right now, uh, particularly with the way that Hanniger has been swinging the bat recently, the way that Garver has been swinging it, the way that, you know, Polanco's kind of stuck in this, like he's okay range, but he hasn't really climbed out of it yet. Like you really can't try and score, you know, six, seven, eight runs to beat these guys. You're probably not going to do it. You have to keep these games around three, four, five runs. And uh, you, you have the pitching lined up tonight. Big test for, for Emerson Hancock, but you do have, you do have a couple of guns going in the next few days uh, after that. So we'll see how, how this whole series matches up again, like taking two or three from this, from, you know, this team would be huge and, and just mm-hmm. keep on winning series like we've talked about, but uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge, you know? And, and so I'm interested to see, like I said, there are some, some really positive things in this matchup. There are some really negative things in this matchup. And I think these are two teams that right now are roughly the same in terms of talent, just overall talent uh, mm-hmm. on their roster. But uh, you know, either team can, can certainly run away with a series if the other one doesn't play well. So you got to play good, solid baseball and you got to find a way to keep these guys, you know, from touching home plate five, six, seven times. Uh, otherwise you're, you're probably looking at a sweep. So yeah. run prevention is the key to this game. The diamondbacks, the diamondbacks have been shut out just once this season. They've scored one run in just one game this season. They've scored two runs in two games this season, which means they've scored three or more runs in the other 22 games, including four double digit games where they scored 17 twice, 16, and I believe 13 uh, in that, uh, or 12 rather. They won 12 to 11 against the Cubs. That was a really fun game back and forth. And these two teams, of course, pretty intertwined with one another over the last eight or so months because of a couple big trades they made with one another. Of course, the Paul Seawald trade back at the deadline last year, and then more recently, the A. Eugenio Suarez trade. And with Gino coming back to town for the first time, kind of renews one of the biggest talking points of the offseason, which is the Mariners' third base situation. So we're going to look at the state of the Mariners' third base situation and then what Gino has been doing down in Arizona in just a moment. But first, a reminder, this episode of the Locked On Mariners podcast is brought to you by DoorDash. Want to make mom smile? Start Mother's Day with flowers or surprise her with gifts from the brand she loves delivered the very same day with DoorDash. Does mom have a sweet tooth? Is she a tech enthusiast, a beauty connoisseur, or is she outdoorsy? No matter what she's into, you can make her smile with a fruit or flower bouquet, makeup, tech gear, workout wear, and a whole lot more. Shop with savings that would make her proud. With a Dash Pass membership, you'll save with a $0 delivery fee and reduce service fees on eligible orders from Dash Pass merchants that meet the minimum subtotal. Other fees, including service fee and terms apply. Get all your Mother's Day gifts all in one place and get 50% off your next order up to $15 when you spend $15 or more on your next flower convenience grocery or retail order now with promo code locked on mlb that's l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-m-l-b order using doordash today terms apply and you're listening to the locked on mariners podcast thank you again for making us your first listen once again the mariners are back at it tonight beginning a three-game set against corbin carroll eugenio suarez and the diamondbacks you can catch all the action on the Mariners' hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app. All you have to do is search Mariners. And speaking of Gino Suarez, we're going to get to see him tonight. He's played in 25 of the Diamondbacks' 26 games so far this season. And, uh, you know, this was a big topic all offseason, the third base situation after the Mariners traded Gino to the Diamondbacks, partly for salary relief, of course, but also because they felt that Gino was approaching the cliff or he had already approached the cliff. Uh, They had some concerns about the bat speed. And so far, it's very early. Things can change at the drop of a hat still. It's only April 26th. But so far, it seems like they were right in that assessment. Gino so far just hitting 234, 308, 351 with an 87 WRC plus he's been worth just 0.1 F4 on the flip side the Mariners of course you know went with a platoon of Josh Rojas and Luis Arias and as of now heading into this game the Mariners third base uh, platoon 
has been good for the third best WRC plus amongst all uh, third base situations in baseball. A 147 WRC plus slashing 268, 355, 476. And the former Diamondback, Josh Rojas, has spearheaded that effort 315, 383, 463 with a 153 WRC plus to start the season. So. Uh, like I said, Colby, th- it seems like the, the Mariners, at least so far, have been right in their assessment of third base. Yeah, uh, I think that's fair to say right now. Now, it's still early enough in the year that if Gino has a really good series, then these numbers can really start to kind of, you know, even out. But uh, even if these numbers are equal, even if they are even at the end of the year, the Mariners still come out ahead because they their third base situation saved them about three or four million dollars now to you and me three and four million dollars doesn't mean anything like who cares how much money you save but to jerry depoto who's working with the budget that three four million dollars could have been the difference in you know uh, whether or not you could have acquired jorge polanco or 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 mitch garver or, or whatever like it was mostly a salary relief trade like we all admit that a small part of this is though that yeah gino's bat looked like it slowed down last year and we know that he's reached the age where traditionally we see pretty serious, uh, you know, uh, bat speed, uh, starts to decline pretty seriously, uh, once you reach Gino's age. So, uh, it was a calculated risk to not pay him this money and think that we can get similar production to what we got from Gino last year for cheaper. And, and so far that's, that's paid off. Uh, Rojas looks great. It, it, it's kind of a continuation of where he, you know, where he was after, I don't know how many games did he play with for the Mariners last year, 45, whatever it was. Um, and Urias, while he's not hitting for any kind of average or really any kind of consistency, he does have a 500 plus slug and he does have a couple big extra base hits and, and he looks totally fine at third base. So does Rojas. So it appears at, I think what we can say objectively right now is that through what 26 games is that where we're at right now, 25 games, mm-hmm. the Mariners have gotten better offensively and defensively at third base from if they had brought Gino back. But I think it's also fair to say that, you know, until we get to the end of the year and we can look at these numbers combined and we can we can look at what Gino actually ends up doing, you know, the the trade itself is still up in the air and, and you could still hate the trade just based on, you know, what it represents. But right now, the Mariners have gotten the better end of not that trade specifically, because if you remember that trade was Vargas and, and Sevi for mm-hmm. uh, for uh, Gino. But what it really was is shed $12 million and try and build something as good over there at third base for cheaper. So we can spend that money elsewhere. And so far that part of the plan, the overall plan has worked very well. Mm -hmm. The specific trade, they were probably never going to win this trade, uh, at least in the fans eyes. So they're not worried about winning individual trades. And this is why we talk about all the time, like wait until the off season's over, look at the big picture because the day they traded Gino for this package, Armageddon, everybody's freaking Mm -hmm. out and and rightfully so totally get it. Yep. Uh, but when you look at it now in the totality of what they did in the off season, you look at that trade and you say, you know, if that, if they had traded, if they had traded Gino for, you know, Josh Rojas, right. And Sebi Zavala and Vargas was just a member of that Paul Seawall trade package, right? If, if that's, if you just flip those two pieces, nobody would bat an eye and they'd say, look, they're, they're really smart. They figured out how to upgrade a third base, uh, on the cheap uh, while also getting rid of a declining player before the clip actually came. So we'll see. I think we all really like Gino. I, I suspect he'll get uh, a very nice ovation tonight when he's announced. Uh, you know, he he's a he's an awesome dude. And, mm-hmm. and he was a really fun player here, and, and he was a really important player uh, here. So no shade being thrown at Gino here. Just the simple fact of the matter is that through 25, 26 games, the Mariners were absolutely right. Now, could that ratio flip? You know, in, in six months, sure, we don't know. But right. as of right now, the Mariners' third baseman or third base spot is probably their second best position group behind catcher. Right. I mean, and it might it's be been, the best. And again, just from an offensive standpoint, when you look at the numbers as a whole, they've had the third best third base situation yeah. in the entire game uh, through the first 25 games of the season. Uh, they've been fantastic. And, and both players have kind of complemented one another well. Mm-hmm. And you know, there was obviously a lot of anxiety about the defense and going from, you know, how good Gino was defensively last year to Rojas. And 
um, you know, Urias with the with the shoulder uh, issue. But so far, those guys have both looked pretty darn good over there. I mean, Urias had a couple of really nice plays uh, yesterday. Mm-hmm. He had, uh, you know, a great defensive game against the Reds about a week ago. Uh, and Rojas right. has been more than fine over there as well defensively. Mm-hmm. Even if you want to nitpick the third base defense, you can't seriously argue that third base defense has been any sort of a problem for the Mariners this year. At the very worst, they are net average at third base. So, yeah, uh, the defense is, has not been a significant hit like a lot of people thought it might be. So, yeah. Uh, and you know. we say all the time how defensive metrics aren't perfect, they're far, far, far from no. perfect, right? I think, you know, again, we just praise Josh Rojas's defense. I believe outs above average has him at a negative one yeah. uh, right now. Yeah, um, fans. But uh, outs above average was a fan of Gino last year. He was 97th percentile plus 11 in that department last year. Uh, mm-hmm. So far to start this year, 18th percentile. Uh, so yeah, po- it's possible that Gino's defense is also taking a little bit of a hit here going from 2023 right. to 2024. Right. One year sample size for defensive metrics are really useless uh, because if you just took that sample size, Josh Rojas was the best second baseman in all of baseball last year defensively because in the short time he played second for the Mariners, he finished the year at like plus six uh, outs above average. And so if you extrapolate that over the course of an entire season, you're talking about the best, you're talking about a platinum gold glove or a platinum glove winner, right? And we know mm-hmm. Rojas isn't that good. So right. yeah, the defensive metrics are always something you have to take with a, you know, the grain of salt. But uh, I, I do think that Gino's probably still a solid defender over there at third, like he has been, uh, you know, for the last three years. And, and last year he was a little bit better than that. And, and I don't think there's a huge drop off between what you would reasonably expect Gino to play and what the uh, Mariners third baseman are playing uh, defensively right now. Yeah. So they, they've been a huge boost and they've helped kind of make up for the uh for the struggles of Mitch Garver and, might, and Jorge uh, Polanco. Yeah. You might be seeing uh Rojas in the leadoff spot for the next few weeks too. I think That's the Mariners really like that idea. Mm-hmm. And with JP out, you know, they could go Julio. Uh but I think they like having Julio hit second appears to be their preference. They might do it where against lefties Julio hits leadoff and then yeah. against righties when Rojas is on the lineup they'll they'll hit yeah. Rojas leadoff and Julio too. Um mm-hmm. Which is what we, so. which is what we saw in, in game two. Rojas led off against the Rangers, and then game three, Rojas wasn't in the lineup. Julio hit hit lead off against uh, yeah. Andrew Heaney, so um, yep. it's possible that's uh, that's how they're going to roll with things here until JP is able to get back. Uh, so let's talk about uh, these pitching matchups in just a moment. But first, a reminder: this episode of <laughs> this episode of the Lockdown Mariners podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash L O C K D O N FanDuel America's number one sports book. And you're listening to the Locked On Mariners podcast. Thank you again for making us your first listen. Once again, the Mariners are back at it tonight, beginning a three game set against Corbin Carroll and the Diamondbacks. You can catch all the action on the Mariners hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on the SXM app. All you have to do is search Mariners. So let's talk about these pitching matchups here, Colby. And I want to specifically focus on Emerson Hancock, who's going toe to toe with Zach Gallon tonight. How does Hancock give the Mariners a chance to win this ball game tonight, Coley? Yeah, you know, it's going to be a, a tough uh, task for Emerson because uh, this is probably the best lineup he's faced uh, so far in his, you know, his season uh, thus far. I think Milwaukee might have a challenge for that. And Mil- pitching in Milwaukee, not easy. You know, it's a pretty decent lineup, and it's a pretty good hitter's ballpark. Uh, the one benefit that Hancock does have tonight is that it's supposed to be kind of a cold, wet, windy kind of night uh, in Seattle. So the roof's probably going to be closed. But, you know, we know how well the ball travels in April uh, when it's, you know, cloudy and, and all that. So 
Uh, maybe the Marine layer helps him out a little bit, but I think for him to really have success against this uh, Diamondbacks lineup, he's got to do what he did against Colorado, and that is live on the edges of the plate. You cannot leave pitches in the middle of the plate, especially if you're Emerson Hancock with his stuff, and expect to get away with it. I mean, you can do it a little bit against Colorado, but to be fair, he didn't even do that to the Rockies. So uh, he's got to be on the corners. He's got to mix it up. He's got to be willing to pitch to all four quadrants, and he has to stay out of the middle of the plate. He has to stay out of the danger zones. Uh, now, again, he's he did that last time out, and you know it was great. He threw, I think it was twenty one of twenty four batters he faced. He threw a first pitch strike like that is off the charts, astronomically good. It doesn't have to be that good, but he's got to be on the corners. He cannot be in the middle of the plate uh, against the Cubs. He was more in the middle of the plate, and he got hit hard, but thankfully through some bad bit block and, and some good defense. Like he only gave up the two runs. So he was, he was managing the Cubs lineup. He kind of dominated the Rockies lineup. And it, the difference there was command. It was not stuff. His stuff didn't magically get better, right? From one start to the next. It's very mediocre stuff. We've been over this, but Hancock, the one tool that he has shown consistently in his brief major league career is that he really does battle through these, through these lineups. He really does grind through at bats. Like he's, not going to blow you away, but he's thinking his way through these at bats. And if he's got the good command, like he did against Colorado, he can manage to work through this lineup two or three times and then give you a chance to win. If he doesn't, it's probably going to be ugly early. And you hope it's not because you don't have an off day for a while. So you really want uh, the bullpen to get rested. Uh, so you, it'd be great if Hancock could give you five or six tonight. And, and again, it, it's all going to come down to the command. There is no question about what the stuff's going to look like tonight because we've seen his stuff at its best and it's still not very good. It's all about command and control. Can you work ahead? Can you get, uh, can you get some swings and misses outside of the zone? You're not going to get a ton inside the zone. Can you limit damage? Can you get ground balls? And that's really what's going to be important for Hancock. So I, I think, you know, we'll have a pretty good idea early on in this game. Mm -hmm. What version of Emerson Hancock we're going to see if he's on the corners and he's dotting guys up and he's working ahead then you might have a chance to kind of, you know, run through this lineup uh, a couple of times before you have to start thinking about the bullpen. If he's missing in the middle of the plate, even if he gets away with it in the first inning, red flags have to be going up because his stuff in the middle of the plate is going to get hit very hard. Yeah. So he's got to be on the corners. You know, he doesn't have the, the Luis Castillo fastball where he can just challenge people in the zone. Right. He's got to be very intentional with all of his pitches. And when he misses, he's got to miss wide. He can't miss, he can't right. miss in. He's got to miss wide. Yeah, like you said, I, I feel like Hancock's best tool right now is his, is his brain, right? He's mm -hmm. he's a very methodical pitcher, and I, I listened yeah. to Logan Gilbert talking to Ryan Roland Smith about him a few days ago, and he you know talked about how Hancock sees the game very similar to to him, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's gonna that's just gonna have to be his best weapon right now because he like you said he doesn't have that overwhelming stuff, so he's basically more or less, for lack of a better term, has to outsmart other lineups and so that's what he's going to have to do against a team like like the diamondbacks who are third right now in contact percentage we talked about how many runs they're putting up right now this is a really good lineup so i'm interested to see how hancock attacks uh the diamondbacks lineup and, and what the game plan is between him and, and cal raleigh tonight uh tomorrow uh we're going to see slade sacconi for the diamondbacks against george kirby kirby's been pushed back a day uh and his last start he said that he wasn't pitching at 100 percent uh, there's something going on with his arm. He wasn't specific about that. We haven't learned more about that. So I assume really the, the big thing there for you heading into that start is just kind of keeping an eye on George's health, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, it was interesting. He said he wasn't a hundred percent last time out. He was still throwing 95, uh, which is well within the range that he would throw. And he still threw, I think 88 pitches. Uh, so it feels like if this was anything super, they were super concerned about, he would just be on the IL right now. And they would just. Right. Like, and they've it. been very cautious with their guys yeah. here to start the season. So that would right. seem oddly out of character for them. Right. We don't know what it is. I, I have to assume it's not elbow or shoulder related because I just feel like we don't even is, know if it's his throwing arm. Yeah. It just, his arm. Yeah. And, and again, this team has been so cautious with how they develop pitchers. I mean, look at, look at Brian Wu, you know, they, they basically went a month without him. Um, you know, when they've said, you know, in like in a playoff situation, like he'd be pitching through this, but like, so they've, they're very cautious 
with those arms. Uh, so if it was elbow or shoulder related, I don't think he'd be pitching right now. Uh, so, you know, one thing that you should always keep an eye on when you know that you have a guy who's kind of, you know, they might skip him. So be on the lookout, maybe randomly tomorrow, Austin both gets a start or whatever. And, and, uh, so we'll see how that goes. But, you know, when you look at him, what he did against, uh, the Rockies in his last outing, velocity was fine. Uh, nothing great, but nothing too concerning. He threw 88 pitches and typically they like to get Kirby out around the 90 pitch mark anyways. So yeah, I didn't see a ton that would lead me to believe this is anything more than, you know, I don't know, blister from throwing the splitter or, or you know, maybe it's, it's a wrist issue or something mm-hmm. like, I don't think this is elbow or shoulder related. Uh, but yeah, obviously you're watching them. You want to see uh control and command. Obviously they're huge uh, for mm-hmm. Kirby, but you also yeah. now, because you know about the, soreness or whatever it is you have to check the radar gun a little bit mm-hmm. and if he's 92 93 early it's a bit of a red flag uh and if he's in the middle of the plate that's also a red flag so i'm not really sure what to expect uh, out of george tomorrow um mm-hmm. you know you would hope that a team like arizona who makes a ton of contact that's a team that george we know that they're going to be aggressive because every team is going to try and be aggressive with kirby if Kirby's not trying to strike guys out because we know he's, you know, this team doesn't strike out a ton that can Mm -hmm. actually play right into his hands. We've seen Kirby do things where he goes six innings on 65 pitches and you're like, right. Wow. He might throw Maddox or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this could work out, but he has to be healthy enough to throw, you know, his, to have his normal control and command and throw with the velocity he's accustomed to. If he can do that, He's got a shot here, and this is one of those teams where it can go either way for George. They could ambush him, and they could get the bat pit luck, and they could you know, run him out of this game early, or Kirby could mow through them because they're being hyper-aggressive, and he's on the corners, and he has his good command, and he can get the, the soft contact early in counts to kind of get deep in this game. So we'll have to wait and see not only what version of George Kirby we get health-wise, but what you know version of Kirby we get with a team that we know will be hyper-aggressive on him early in counts. We basically know the deal with Logan Gilbert. I don't. I don't think we really need to talk much about him. He's been fantastic this year, uh, coming off of a, a nice start in Texas. He's starting the Sunday game. Uh, anything stand out to you about these Diamondbacks pitchers? It's Brandon Fott on on Sunday for the D backs, and then like I mentioned, Gallon tonight, and then Sacconi mm-hmm. tomorrow. Yeah, Gallon's an interesting arm because he is a. He's not an ace. Uh, he's probably closer to a number two, but he's a very good pitcher, but he doesn't do it with velocity. It's 92 to 93. Uh, and it's really, it's, it's closer to a two pitch mix and it is a three pitch mix. It's the forcing fastball and then a knuckle curve. Uh, that is very good. So, uh, we talk about, you know, how the Mariners struggle with spin and all that. Gallon's not really a spin guy. Uh, the knuckle curve doesn't have outrageous spin rates and all that stuff. So is it really about spin or is it about breaking balls? There's a difference there. Not every breaking ball is a high spin breaking ball. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how they handle that. Uh, Foft was a guy who had a really nice postseason, but kind of, eh, you know, in the regular season. Sacconi is a guy that I've liked for a while uh, in, in the Diamondback system, but uh, I don't have a good enough feel for how uh, he's going to perform to really give you any insight. So Tonight, it's forcing fastball, 92, 93. Uh, it's a fastball that plays up more than that. Uh, so it, it won't be unusual to see them swing through 92 in the middle of the plate. Uh, you know, velocity is not everything here. I think the tonight's game is going to come down to how well they handle that knuckle curve. It is Gallon's best pitch, and uh, he throws it pretty often. So uh, you do have to, you know, it, it's pretty much fastball curveball. I think the approach tonight, the game plan tonight at the plate is just to go up there and look for one of those two pitches. If you can throw you something else in the strike zone, fine. You take it, you move on, but you got to be ready to hit it. It's, it's kind of similar to, uh, to Aaron Nola is who Zach Allen reminds me of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, any other thoughts here before we get out of here? No, you know, um, try and find a way to win this series. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be a tough one. Uh, you know, Arizona, not a team that's playing super well right now, but fortunately the Mariners do avoid uh, Merrill Kelly, unfortunately, because he's on the IL and they also uh, avoid Jordan Montgomery. So uh, who's been throwing the ball pretty well. Uh, also Ed- Eduardo Rodriguez on the IL. Oh, yeah. He has not pitched yet this year. So you know, the Mariners, signed him. yeah, uh, the Mariners have got pretty fortunate thus far mm-hmm. uh, or in the series just based on when they're playing Arizona. Mm. But again, it is, it's really imperative. I don't see them winning seven to five games here. I think if they're going to beat Arizona, they're going to have to do it 
four to two, five to three, mm-hmm. you know, maybe even one nothing or something like that. So we'll see. Right. But it sure would be great if, if you know, somebody, one of the big offseason additions could step up and have a really good series here, uh, you know, at home with three righties on on the mound. That's going to do it for our show. But before we get out of here, a reminder that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Locked On Mariners podcast. For Colby Patnode, I'm Tidane Gonzalez. Be sure to give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Mariners. You can follow me at Ty Dane Gonzalez and Colby at CPAT11. That's CPAT11. You can also find all that stuff in the description of this episode. Thank you again for making us your first listen. Have yourself a beautiful baseball day and a beautiful baseball weekend, and we'll see you next time. Peace.